Hello everyone. The late 11th century. From different parts of Western Europe, tens of thousands of people, nobles and knights, but also clerks, soldiers and peasants, and even sometimes women and children, answered a call. The call to travel to the Holy Land and conquer it. For almost two centuries, the call of faith, adventure, sometimes ambition, greed or glory, would motivate Christians to become crusaders and embark on a journey many of them would never come back from. Why did this clash happen? How did it unfold? And what were the consequences? This would be our story tonight. One of power struggles and politics, tragedies, battles, social and cultural change, of rise and fall of states in the Near East, and religious military orders such as the Knights Templar, and many more things. We have a lot to explore, so much that this story will be in two parts, and this is part one. Part two will be available soon. So make yourself comfortable, sit or lie down, and as always, you can follow eyes shut. So don't hesitate to let yourself go and fall asleep. The story will wait for you if you wish to return later. You have timestamps to help you navigate between the chapters. And as always, I invite you to check my Patreon page if you wish to support this channel. There is a link in the description and in the pinned comment down below. And also Spotify, Apple Music or Amazon Music if you prefer to listen to my stories there. Now, let the tension go in your shoulders. Take a moment to find the right position for you. We have a joyful fire gently cracking in my study tonight. It is all cozy and just at the right temperature. And now that we are all set, off we go. Our story begins in the old world, more than 900 years ago. But how was this part of the world like? at the time. Several centuries earlier, in the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire had collapsed, and Western Europe had fallen into a long period of decline. Demographic decline, its population had fallen for generations, economic and urban decline too. Cities had shrunk, a lot of Roman roads, aqueducts and buildings had fallen into disrepair, and Europe had fragmented politically. It took its centuries to slowly rebuild itself, and this period, after the fall of the Roman Empire, is often called the Dark Ages. These were dark times indeed, if we consider the loss of culture, the end of the rule of Roman law, the setbacks in standards of living, the wars, but also a period when new states appeared and a new type of society emerged, a society of a feudal kind, based on a strict hierarchy that gave everyone a position an allegiance to a master, a lord, 
all the way up from peasants to kings. This system had variations and was not always in place. There were other political forms like city-states. But for a large part of the European population, it had become the norm by the 9th and 10th centuries. The early Middle Ages was also an eventful period. New states appeared and attempted to recreate political unity, such as the Empire of Charlemagne in the 8th and 9th centuries, that had its center in what would become Germany and France. And for a short time, Charlemagne managed to unite much of Western Europe. Another major phenomenon was the expansion of Christianity to most of Europe, East and West. This had begun before, within the frontiers of the Roman Empire, which had become Christianized in its last centuries. But instead of collapsing with Rome, Christianity survived and managed to convert the invaders, especially Germanic peoples that raised new kingdoms on the ashes of the Roman Empire. By the 10th and 11th centuries, Christianity had expanded far to the north, to Scandinavia, and also to the west, including in regions where Celtic culture had survived for a long time, like Scotland or Ireland, or to the east, in the lands of the Slavs, Eastern Europe and the Balkans. In Western European regions, like Germany, the Netherlands, France, Great Britain, or the north of Italy and the north of Spain, Christianity, or Roman Catholicism more precisely, was now a major force to be reckoned with, not just politically, or because it had a, a large network of parishes and bishoprics, but even more socially. It had become central to the life of communities and individuals. You could be a peasant or a lord, a monk or a craftsman. Your entire life in Western Europe happened within the Catholic faith, from birth to death, with rituals and codes of conduct that were determined by the Catholic Church. It doesn't mean every single person was perfectly observant, and it doesn't exclude the appearance of so-called heresies, but to the average regular person, it was unthinkable not to be Christian, and together with their social position, Christianity was the single most important characteristic of their identity, well before their belonging to the country. There was very little sense of belonging to a country back then. Nationalism just didn't exist as a concept. Our perception of the Middle Ages is often based on anachronisms, because much later, modern categories like nations or stereotypes about the supposed obscurantism of the period were forced onto these centuries. For example, the depiction of medieval times tends to oscillate between a very dark take with dirty people living in an age of violence and absence of laws. Or, when it is not this, another extreme, a colorful and joyful vision that looks like fantasy almost. But both are cliches. The dark vision may have existed punctually. And it is true that, based on our modern tolerance of physical violence, 
the early Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, were a very harsh, violent period. But war was not permanent. People did not live in miserable huts, and they were actually not that dirty. The typical tavern, for example, in shows or movies, is a dark room filled with warriors and thieves and prostitutes. But in reality, taverns generally doubled as bathhouses. And there were places where people would go to get clean, to clean up. Their clothes were not all grey and black. Textiles were dyed in different colors. And people were not toothless either. Their diet was based on grain, vegetables and occasionally meat or fish, depending on the region. Nothing that would make them lose their teeth early. It is just a detail, but another anachronism is the music we identify as medieval in TV shows or movies. Typically it is not medieval, but Renaissance-inspired music from the 15th or 16th centuries. So, to better understand or correctly picture the medieval period in its diversity, because it is a very long period, several centuries with major changes between the beginning and the end, we need to let go of many stereotypes and uh, anachronisms about people's mentalities, the way they saw the world, the way society worked, or the environment they lived in. In this society, people typically lived and died in the same place, even the same village. By the 11th century, when the Crusades would begin, Cities were still small, and the vast majority of the population lived in towns, villages or hamlets. There was a small fraction of society, knights, high nobles, diplomats or high-ranking members of the church, who were very mobile and traveled across Europe. But to most people, the rest of the world beyond the frontiers of their region was a mystery. They would never see a map in their life, and the faraway lands, including this holy land they heard about, almost existed on another plane. These were not places they were supposed to even go to. I am telling you all this because it is important to understand what will follow. Now that was for Europe, but what about other regions around it? In the east, the eastern part of the Roman Empire had survived, and even for a time it had thrived. When the western Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century, the eastern part had been much better preserved from invasions and overall it was in a better shape. So it tried to recreate, to reconquer the empire. It looked like a gigantic task, but not an impossible one. Roman history had been troubled several times during civil wars, and the reunification had been achieved before. So in the 6th and 7th century, the eastern part of the empire managed to get back significant parts of previously Roman lands, including in Italy and North Africa. We call the eastern Roman empire Byzantium, after their capital Byzantium or Constantinople, but they just call themselves Romans. Byzantium is a term that has been used later in the West, to name the Eastern Roman Empire and somehow distinguish it from Rome, for various reasons. 
first it was far away from the cradle of the Roman state, and culturally Byzantium was more Greek than Latin, so it made a certain sense. But there were also political reasons. The Holy Roman Empire had emerged centered on Germany and the north of Italy. It was not a single state, but a loose confederation with elected emperors that claimed to be successors of Charlemagne as the new Roman emperors. So calling Roman Empire this surviving state in the East was not convenient, even though on many counts Byzantium was much more Roman than the Holy Roman Empire. And later, there was a religious schism between Rome and Constantinople, separating Christianity into the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox traditions. Another reason to not attribute the term Roman to Byzantium. In any case, from now on, I would call the Eastern Roman Empire Byzantium, because this is the usual name now and it is convenient. But let's bear in mind that this is not how the Byzantines called themselves. They called themselves Romans. So, at the start, Byzantium managed to get back parts of the Western Roman Empire. But this was short-lived, because Byzantium was facing too many enemies at once on its frontiers. And starting in the 7th century, the most formidable of all, the Arabs. From Arabia, the Muslim conquest had begun a few years after the deaths of Prophet Muhammad in 632. The Arabs and their new religion, Islam, quickly expanded to the Middle East and North Africa. At the start, nothing seemed able to stop them and they took a lot of territories from Byzantium, including Egypt, Palestine and Syria. To the west, the Muslim wave went as far as Morocco and Spain, and to the east, by conversion and conquest, it ended all the way east to Indonesia several centuries later. But after a brilliant century, In the Middle East and Europe, this wave stalled, and the new Muslim empire was hit by political fragmentation. That was the fate of all ancient empires, eventually, and this one was no exception. Rival dynasties emerged within it. During the initial phase of the conquest, the first caliphate, called the Rashidun Caliphate, was ruled by surviving followers of Muhammad. A caliph in Islam is a person considered a political and religious successor to the Islamic prophet, to Muhammad, and therefore a leader of the Muslim world, the Ummah. The caliphate is the institution, the state, the political entity ruled by a caliph. This title was claimed several times along history. It is obviously the highest possible title for a Muslim ruler, for a Muslim monarch. So the first caliphate, the Rashidun, was the one during the very fast initial expansion of the years 640 and 650. By the end of it, the frontiers had reached Tunisia in the west and Persia in the east, and they already included most of the Middle East, leaving only parts of Anatolia, that is to say modern Turkey, to Byzantium. But the Rashidun Caliphate ended in 661, and power went to a new clan the Umayyads, also linked to the origins of Islam. This clan, the Umayyads, 
was powerful in Mecca in pre-Islamic times and actually opposed Muhammad before converting and joining his circle. They had acquired power in Syria during the Rashidun Caliphate with Damascus as their main city. And when one of them could claim the title of Caliph, they turned Damascus into the new capital of the Islamic world. They continued the conquests, taking a bit more to Byzantium, but mainly to the west. This is when Algeria, Morocco, Portugal and almost all of Spain joined their empire. The Umayyads ruled for 90 years until 750, with succession conflicts sometimes, but the unity of the Muslim empire was preserved during this period, and it was still an extremely successful empire. It seemed almost unstoppable. But in 750, another dynasty, the Abbasids, overthrowed the Umayyads, and they established a new caliphate, the third one. Twelve years later, they moved their capital to a new city, Baghdad, near the ancient site of Babylon in Mesopotamia. And as a caliphate, the Abbasids lasted for several centuries, but centuries during which the Muslim world fragmented suffered invasions, and the faraway provinces became independent, so that the number of Muslim states increased, and sometimes they were competing or in conflict. At the court of the Abbasids, the Arab heritage was also diluted over time, and the Abbasids adopted a lot of cultural traits and customs of people that had been converted to Islam, especially from the Persians. So, politically and militarily, the Muslim expansion was stalling, but Baghdad became a center of science, culture and invention, a place that absorbed and built on a lot of the intellectual heritage from the antiquity, from Rome and Greece with libraries, centers of learning, and the city became emblematic of a cultural and economic golden age that lasted for decades in the 8th and 9th centuries. But as I told you, their empire was too large, or they were not strong enough to keep it united. A hundred and fifty years had now passed since the start of the Muslim expansion, and the initial boost had faded. There were now these competing dynasties for large and wealthy territories, and political considerations or ambitions tended to erase the attachment to a unity that had characterized the first decades of the Muslim expansion. So the Abbasids had to cede Spain and Portugal to the rule of the Umayyads, who had seeked refuge to the west, and more territories around the Mediterranean Sea and in Central Asia were lost to local rulers, who vaguely recognized the authority of the Abbasid caliphs, but in practice were independent. Their weakening went on, and Baghdad fell to invaders in 945, and again a second time in 1055, by the middle of the 11th century, 40 years before the First Crusade. These invaders of the 11th century were the Seljuk Turks, a people and a dynasty from Central Asia, they had converted to Islam, but they were willing to establish their own empire. Eventually, the Seljuk Turks took Syria and Palestine, almost all of Anatolia, 
and their eruption in the Middle East was a huge blow to the political power of the Abbasids. At the time of the Seljuk invasion, another powerful state to their west, this one, was the Fatimid dynasty. The Fatimids were of Arab origin, and they are called Fatimids because they traced their ancestry to Fatima, Muhammad's daughter. The Umayyads still had Spain, but the Fatimids had Morocco, and from there they expanded eastward, taking all the coast of North Africa, all the way to Egypt and the Red Sea in the 10th and 11th centuries. The Fatimids proclaimed themselves caliphs, and they followed the Shia tradition, as opposed to the Abbasids who were Sunni. So they also were a religious challenge to them. As you know, Shia and Sunni are the two main competing traditions, denominations of Islam. After a schism that happened at the time of Muhammad's succession. So, in summary, this is how things were in the late 11th century when the first crusade happened. The Muslim world had fragmented into multiple states from Spain to Persia, competing caliphates, and was weakened by walls, especially in the Middle East with the rise of the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuk push did not go unnoticed in the West, because in 1071, 24 years before the First Crusade, the Turks inflicted a big defeat to Byzantium. And Byzantium was seen as a shield between Eastern Europe and the Muslims. And two years later, in 1073, the Turks took control of Jerusalem. This was the first root cause of the Crusade. The Seljuk hold on Jerusalem was weak, and later they lost it to the Fatimids, we will see that later. But Christian pilgrims reported difficulties and the oppression of Christians who traveled to the region due to the chaotic situation in the Holy Land. Prior to that, it was not easy, but pilgrims could travel to Jerusalem under Abbasid rule, and Christian communities could continue to exist inside the Caliphate. They were pushed to convert to Islam, and many did, they were discriminated against with special taxes or their ban from certain functions, but other than that, they were tolerated. Minorities are often the first victims when a state is destabilized, and this was no exception. With the weakening of the Abbasids, the Seljuk invasion, and the lack of order, the situation of Christians in Palestine and in Syria became more precarious. And this was noticed in Rome and Western Europe, because a tradition of pilgrimage to Jerusalem had gained traction in the 11th century. The numbers were small, but more and more Christian pilgrims did the trip to Palestine to visit Jerusalem. The news also circulated because there were trade links between the Italian peninsula, with Venice in particular, and the Middle East, including Byzantium and the Abbasids and Fatimid caliphates. So that was the first motivation to do something about it and it was amplified by a recent evolution in the doctrine of the Church. Between 1050 and 1080, there was a series of reforms in Rome, called the Gregorian Reforms, after Pope Gregory VII, 
these reforms touched on several areas. They included enforcing compulsory celibacy among the clergy, or centralizing a bit more the Roman Catholic Church. And these reforms followed the schism with the Eastern Church that had happened in 1054. The separation of Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, the biggest schism in Christianity since its appearance, was still fresh, and so a concern in Rome was to reassert the supremacy of the popes, to proclaim that the Roman Catholic Church was the one and only, and to expand its political influence. The concept of separating political and religious powers is something that was not theorized during the Middle Ages. It was not even a concept. And there were often conflicts of influence between kings or high nobles and the church, the clergy. The Catholic faith was so important in Western Europe that secular rulers were always tempted to intervene in matters of the church. And at the same time, the church had the pretension to be above secular power. This overlap was not specific to the Christian world. As we have seen, in the same manner, Muslim caliphs were at the same time political and religious leaders. So, as the 11th century advanced, the Pope was increasingly assertive, politically. Popes had their own small state around Rome in central Italy, but they also saw themselves as the ones who could make arbitrages between secular sovereigns, influence their policies, designate common enemies, And actually, to assert this principle, the Pope tried, 20 years before the First Crusade, to organize a military expedition in support of Byzantium against the Seljuk Turks. It didn't gain traction at all, and nothing happened, because no significant sovereign responded to the call. But it already showed the uh, intent the will to be interventionist, to turn the papacy into not just a religious and spiritual authority, but a political, strategic leader of the Christian world. There was the fresh schism with Byzantium, and the two churches, Catholic and Orthodox, had excommunicated each other, But contacts had been kept with Byzantium, and of two evils, the Turks were the greater. So that's why Rome was willing to help Byzantium, and Byzantium did ask for help. Its situation had become precarious at the time, with almost all of its Middle Eastern possessions now lost. So you had this chaotic situation in Palestine, around Jerusalem, Byzantium asking for help against the Turks that had also taken control of Jerusalem, and the papacy willing to play an active role. There were also maybe other underlying reasons that led to the First Crusade. One was that, overall, the 11th century had been a period of relative prosperity, compared to previous centuries. It was still a time when what would become European countries and nations were in formation. Italy was fragmented, Spain was mostly occupied by the Umayyads, but in the north of Spain, small Christian kingdoms had begun to push back in what would later be called the Reconquista the reconquest of Spain against the Muslims. In Germany, also fragmented, the Holy Roman Emperors were trying to assert their power. 
in France, a new dynasty, the Capetians, had been elected to the throne. And even though the kings had limited power, this helped keep France at peace internally. And in England, the Norman invasion had taken place 30 years before the crusade. The Battle of Hastings was in 1066. And the basis of a new kingdom had been laid. To the north, Viking raids and invasions had turned less devastating, and Scandinavia was being absorbed into the Christian world. So Europe was far from united and stabilized, but it was in a better position to project power outside its limits than at any point since the beginning of the Middle Ages centuries earlier. The climate had also turned a bit more favorable during the 11th century. More arable land had been gained on forests, and slowly but surely, agricultural innovations had been developed, like more mills or crop rotation, the practice of growing different types of crops in the same area across a sequence of seasons, to spare and rejuvenate the soils, resulting in better yields. All this had allowed demographic growth. And another burgeoning phenomenon was the reappearance of trade routes inside Europe. With a bit more stability, trade between Italy and France or Italy and Germany through the Alps along the Rhône or Rhine rivers could reopen after centuries, or between England and the continent after the Dukes of Normandy conquered England, or around the Baltic Sea. Yet another notable evolution and factor behind the Crusades was the installation of the feudal society model. It created a kind of caste of warriors, whose social function and reason to be was to fight. That meant a, a stock of fighters you could tap into, and it also meant they needed to be used to something when order was restored and there was no immediate threats on the frontiers. What do you do with these people? when you are not at war. In that case, it can be tempting, convenient, to send them away, to avoid the internal threat they could become. So as you see, there were a variety of causes that led to the First Crusade, from the evolution of European Christian societies, to the perception of the Islamic threat, the growing medieval tradition of pilgrimages to Jerusalem, the internal conflicts of the Muslims, or the willingness of the popes to be more interventionist and politically active after Gregorian reforms. Historians still debate the weight and interactions between these factors. What is factual is that all this background resulted in one goal, in 1095. During a council held at Clermont in the center of France, a council that is to say an assembly of bishops. So during this council, Pope Urban II called all Christian monarchs and nobles of Europe to mobilize, to go to the Holy Land and liberate it. Envoys from Byzantium had asked for aid, and on top of all the reasons we already discussed before, the Pope may have hoped that responding positively could help heal the Great Schism that had happened 40 years earlier, and help reunite the Church. The mood at the time was to reconciliation, and interestingly, Urban's sermon at this council did not just talk of liberating Jerusalem or the Holy Land, 
it was quite comprehensive. He talked about the violence of European society and the need to channel or heal it. He talked about helping the Eastern Roman Empire, the Greeks as they were called at the time, who were brothers in faith and had called for help. And he also said that despite its condemnation of violence and war, the Church would encourage and sanctify a kind of armed pilgrimage, a new kind of war, that would guarantee any man who would undertake it and die in the process, the remission of sins and the rewards in heaven. As you see, this goes beyond simply religious or spiritual reasons. The Pope knew he was addressing sovereigns. He was one himself. And the considerations he gave included strategy, diplomacy and the stability of their lands. This call was answered with enthusiasm especially in France, where the council had taken place. Urban II was also born in France, which may have helped. That would evolve in later crusades. But the vast majority of participants to this first crusade were actually French knights and soldiers, led by a majority of the most influential and powerful nobles of the kingdom including the Counts of Toulouse and Flanders. They were joined by many other houses, large and small, including Robert of Normandy, the eldest son of William the Conqueror, who was the brother of William II of England and an unsuccessful pretender to the throne of England. This mobilization went far beyond the hopes of the papacy. It is hard to know exactly how many men joined, but estimates indicate around 70,000 to 80,000 who left Western Europe in the year following the Council of Clermont. More joined them along the three following years of the crusade. The number of knights ranged from 7,000 to 10,000, so a significant number that shows how Europe, and especially France, was drained of its knights. With them, 35,000 to 50,000 foot soldiers, and including non-combatants, the figure may have reached 100,000 for this official crusade. Official because there was also a surprise. Also motivated by the same call, another expedition called the People's Crusade happened, less organized and also tragically doomed to fail. I'll tell you about it later. The response to the Pope's call was so enthusiastic that not just nobles and soldiers volunteered. There were also peasants with no fighting skills, monks or women who wanted to join. A hundred thousand people only for the official crusade is a huge number for the time. Medieval armies were small. A large battle in Europe at the time pitched a few thousand men on each side. Even 300 years later, during the Hundred Years' War, the largest battles between England and France rarely involved more than 10,000 people. So a hundred thousand is a reflection of the enthusiasm around the expedition. But what were these people's motivations exactly? They are hard to assess precisely because of the lack of records about them. It seems personal piety was a major one. As I said at the beginning, the secular medieval world, many aspects of each person's life were so ingrained with the Christian faith and spiritual world of the church that it was immediately attractive to join for many people. Joining the crusade felt like an obvious path 
an opportunity to achieve one's destiny and find at the same time glory and redemption in the eye of God. There could have been social pressure too. It is hard to resist a call when your peers and relatives are all answering it. In at least some cases, personal advancement seems to have been a goal too, for powerful nobles. For example, in the case of a Norman leader called Bohemond of Taranto. Of Taranto, which is in Italy, because earlier there had been a conquest led by Normans from the northwest of France to the south of Italy and Normans had established fiefdoms there that they used as a base. Bohemond had gone to war with Byzantium before to try to carve himself out a territory in the east, a kind of own personal kingdom. The call to the crusade gave him the opportunity to try again, but this time not against the Byzantines, but rather against the Turks and with the approval of the Pope, so he did not let the opportunity escape. The logistics were complicated, with men volunteering from different regions, and so it was planned that different armies would travel separately to Constantinople, to the capital of Byzantium. They would join forces there and continue their expedition entering enemy territory with Jerusalem and Palestine as their final destination. Because at the time, the Turks held most of Anatolia at the doors of Constantinople. I told you that while this preparation was taking place, another expedition was forming. One that has been called the People's Crusade. Pope Urban had planned the departure of the First Crusade for August 1096. But months before this, in the enthusiasm of the response to his call, unexpected armies of peasants and lesser nobles had formed and decided to set off for Jerusalem on their own. They were led by a priest called Pierre l'Hermite, Peter the Hermit. Peter was a Catholic priest from northern France who was not sanctioned by the Pope as an official preacher for the crusade, but he did it nevertheless, and due to his charisma and the fertile ground he was working on, plus his discourse that even peasants, women and children could join the crusade, he mobilized thousands possibly tens of thousands of enthusiastic followers. Most of them were completely unfit for combat and had never left their village. But they did with him and for him, and they followed him, starting to march towards Eastern Europe. This People's Crusade was also joined by a few knights and small nobles it was not totally unexperienced, but overall it was disorganized and with very little planning. The participants were poor, meaning they left with almost nothing, and also meaning that they would need to live on the lands they would cross. You immediately understand the huge original flow this expedition had between its lack of supplies and absence of plan. They marched in separate armies, but found themselves in trouble while they were still in Christian territory. They fought for food against the Hungarians in the Balkans, around Belgrade, even though the Hungarians were fellow Christians. But because this people's crusade constantly needed food and supplies, they were in practice looting the regions they crossed. Thousands died or abandoned on the way to Constantinople. 
doing more harm than good in the regions they crossed. But finally, the various armies of this crusade reached Constantinople. And there again, the problem of food was pressing, and the mob began to loot outside the city. The Byzantines tried to control them as much as they could. But the only solution to get rid of this crowd they could not feed and that didn't seem to have much military value was to let them go on and send them fighting. So they helped ferry them to the other side of the Bosphorus, the strait between Europe and Asia Minor, where Constantinople was located. The territory of Byzantium ended not far away on the other side at the time. And so the People's Crusade began to wander into Seljuk territory. There was no way this crowd of people could survive a battle against well-equipped and experienced soldiers. And indeed, they didn't. A few unequal battles against Seljuk soldiers took place, in which most of the crusade was massacred or scattered. The People's Crusade ended there as a tragic failure, and most of the crowd never returned home. Peter the Hermit, the leader, escaped, and he returned to France. There is no record of what he thought or how he was seen after sending thousands to their deaths in a fit of enthusiasm. He may have founded a monastery but his trail mostly disappears after 1096. Another unfortunate legacy of the People's Crusade is a series of exactions of abuses towards Jewish populations in the region of the Rhine River when the expedition crossed it. In the enthusiasm of the Crusade, willing to fight and making no distinction between non-Christians, the mobs attacked Jewish communities on their way. One of the numerous attacks against the Jews during the Middle Ages. So that was for the People's Crusade. But as these events were unfolding, the official crusade and its various armies, totaling about 70,000 to 80,000 people, was also approaching Constantinople and it gathered over several months outside its walls. The Byzantine Emperor, Alexios, was certainly happy to see this vast army of allies join him, but he was also suspicious after the bad memory of the People's Crusade and its lootings. Plus, the official crusade had Bohemond of Taranto as one of its leaders, you remember this Norman lord established in the south of Italy who had already attacked before Byzantium. So that did not help with trust issues either. And there were tensions between Byzantium and the crusaders indeed. Alexios demanded they swore an oath to return territories they would conquer to his empire against his help with food and transportation to Anatolia. Eventually, most leaders accepted and swore the oath. As we will see later, it wouldn't be respected. And the Byzantines helped, but they limited their support to food, supplies, ferries, and a couple generals to assist them. None of the troops that they had uh, more or less promised to contribute to the crusade when they were pleading their case to Pope Urban II. But still, the army could cross to the other side of the Bosphorus. After that, the crusader army was in enemy territory and would only be able to count on itself. During the first semester of 1097, 18 months after the Council of Clermont, 
when Pope Urban had called to this holy war. The large army crossed to Anatolia, to Asia Minor. The time for fighting had now arrived. Jerusalem was hundreds of miles away from Constantinople, and the journey would be long, several months at least. The army was several tens of thousands of men strong, and it had multiple leaders without a single authority. These leaders included Raymond IV, the Count of Toulouse, and Ademar de Monteil, the representative of the Pope in the Crusade. They both had brought a large number of troops from southern France. Another important group from Upper and Lower Lorraine, in what is now the east of France, was led by Godfrey of Bouillon, another noble who had supported the crusade early on and gathered various noble houses with thousands of soldiers. Bohemond of Taranto was another figure of authority and the most experienced military chief. We already talked about him. He led a group of Italo-Norman troops. There were also various contingents from northern France and Flanders, led by the counts of Blois, Vermandois and Flanders, and by the Duke of Normandy, Robert Cuthrose, the eldest son of William the Conqueror. So, as you see, the bulk of troops came from France and around it, and their leaders, with their titles and vassals that also participated in the expedition, this reflected the complexity of the feudal system, with its chains of command based on allegiances. This was barely understandable to the Byzantines, let alone the Turks and the Arabs. So they saw the army as a whole and called the invaders the Franks. For the duration of the Crusades, several generations, this is how the Crusaders would be called on the other side, regardless of where they came from, France or other European countries. I told you the giant army had crossed to Anatolia in the first half of 1097, and they would have to cross Anatolia, then Syria, before reaching Palestine. But marching straight to Jerusalem was not an option. They would have ended up isolated and surrounded in Seljuk territory. On the way, there were cities and forts that would have to be conquered. And so their first objective, their first target, was the city of Nicaea, a city once under Byzantine rule, but that had become a main city of the Seljuks. After a few weeks of siege, the city fell, not without big losses, on the crusaders' side. But that was a good start. And after that, the uh, army marched through Anatolia and faced a larger Seljuk army at a battle, the Battle of Dorylium, that they won thanks to their numbers and discipline. Having defeated the main force of the Turks in Anatolia, they could continue to the southeast in the direction of Syria. But they were faced with two problems. First, the Seljuks practiced the scorched land strategy to weaken them. That is to say, they destroyed all harvests and equipment that could have helped the invaders. So that, as often, when large armies were on the move, they had to resort to looting, to pillages, to sustain themselves. And this did not garner support from the locals. Second, the army did not have a single leader. The spiritual and religious authority of Ademar 
the Pope's legate, that is to say, the Pope's representative, was not questioned. But each noble had their troops and did not intend to cede control. There was a degree of cooperation, but ultimately each leader could take their followers in the direction they wanted. And this is exactly what two chiefs did. Baldwin of Boulogne, a brother of Godfrey of Bouillon, and a Count of Boulogne in northern France, and Tancred, an Italo-Norman leader, nephew of Bohemond of Taranto. They broke away from the main army together, and they went eastward towards the Armenian lands, before marching south to the limit between Anatolia and Syria. Baldwin was well decided to carve himself a territory of his own in these lands, and that's what he did. In a chaotic campaign, he conquered lands around the city of Edessa and assumed the title of Count of Edessa in 1098, establishing the first of the Crusader state. There will be more, as we will see. The county of Edessa was inland around the modern frontier of Turkey and Syria, and it lasted for a few decades. We will see in the second part of this story, that the fall of Edessa to the Muslims in 1144 would be the trigger to a second crusade. As Baldwin of Boulogne was pursuing his personal goals with a small force, the main army had marched through Anatolia and prepared to besiege Antioch situated midway between Constantinople and Jerusalem. Antioch at the time was a major city, heavily fortified, and leaving it intact in their back was not an option. So they led siege in October 1097. The siege was lengthy, supplied cruelly missed, and hundreds, possibly thousands of crusaders, died of starvation. It lasted eight months, with the invaders launching assaults and the Seljuks sending armies and smaller contingents to try to relieve the city or ambush the Franks around it. All were defeated until finally the city fell in June 1098, only to be immediately encircled by yet another Seljuk force that the crusaders managed to disperse by attacking it immediately. In total, the siege of Antioch cost thousands of lives on each side, and to make things worse, a plague broke out shortly after, killing many among the army, including Ademar, the Pope's legate. At this point, arguments between the various leaders multiplied, and they spent or they lost the rest of the year in and around Antioch that they now controlled, arguing over the strategy to follow. In practice, the Franks from northern France, the Normans and the Provençals from southern France did not feel like parts of a single nation at all. And why would they? Their languages were different. And more importantly, they had different rules. And the initial enthusiasm of going on this armed pilgrimage together as Christians had stalled a bit after almost two years of fighting. But finally, at the beginning of 1099, the march to Jerusalem restarted. After another split, Bohemond of Taranto stayed behind with his men as the first prince of Antioch. At least his ambition was satisfied. He had his own land and title. 
and the rest of the army marched south. They only had to follow the coastline for a few hundred miles to reach Jerusalem. It is hard to know how many men remained at this point. Maybe a quarter or a third of the initial force. They had received a few more crusaders who continued to join their effort. But they had lost many more in the fights, sieges and previous splits of the main force. But at least thousands of men remained, still a considerable force. And this time they encountered little resistance on their way to Jerusalem as they proceeded down the Mediterranean coast. The two main remaining leaders at this point were the Count of Toulouse, Raymond IV, and Godfrey of Bouillon. The others were lesser nobles that had less troops, wealth, or authority. In the meantime, the situation had evolved in the Holy Land. The Seljuks were now in retreat. In the 11th century, they had been a formidable force that had erupted in the Middle East and taken it by storm. But their good fortunes were turning. They were surrounded by enemies. They had uh, internal dissensions. And on top of that, they had been surprised by the eruption of this large crusader army that had taken their cities and carved new states on their lands. As the Crusaders were besieging Antioch, the Fatimids had noticed this and advanced to the east, taking Jerusalem. You remember the Fatimids were this dynasty, this caliphate, that controlled North Africa, from Morocco to Egypt. And to this, they had now just added the Holy Land, Palestine and Jerusalem. The Fatimids were not willing to go to war with the Crusaders. So they offered a deal. If the Crusaders did not advance into their domains, they would recognize a frontier with them and guarantee freedom of passage to Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land. But this was completely unacceptable to the Crusaders for several reasons. Several of them had their own ambitions. There was the fact that launching a crusade from so far to end it negotiating with Muslims and letting them have Jerusalem would have been absurd. And there were still knights in the army who wanted to fight at any cost. So the offer was rejected. Even though, realistically, Crusaders' forces at this point now looked relatively small. They have been estimated at around 12,000, including 1,500 cavalry. But they still began the siege of Jerusalem with what they had, with what remained. Even though they didn't have enough troops to encircle the city, meaning the only hope to take it was to launch assaults. At this time, their cooperation had reached a low point, and forces attacked separately, which made the first assault in June 1099 fail. They regrouped, understood that a concerted attack was the only option, and after a few weeks, the city finally fell. On the 15th of July, 1099, Three years after the beginning of the crusade, Jerusalem had finally fell to Christian hands again, for the first time since the 7th century. Between the exhaustion, the excitement of victory, and uh, the burst of religious enthusiasm that followed the fall of the city, massacres took place, and it seems they were particularly ugly. Many civilian inhabitants were robbed and slaughtered. The scale of these massacres is uncertain, 
but there are multiple eyewitness accounts from crusaders that indicate these were probably the worst exactions of the entire crusade. Christian inhabitants had been expelled by the Fatimid governor before the arrival of the crusader army but Muslim and Jewish populations were decimated. This could have ended the crusade, but not yet. A few weeks after the capture of Jerusalem, a force of 20,000 Fatimids landed at Ascalon on the Mediterranean coast, 50 miles from Jerusalem. The crusaders had only half that number at this point. 9,000 foot soldiers and 1,200 knights. They were also exhausted despite the excitement of their recent victory in Jerusalem. But what they had was experience and troops extremely toughened by two years of combat since they had left Constantinople. The Muslim force was relatively unprepared and inexperienced and that would be its doom. Led by Godfrey of Bouillon and Raymond of Toulouse, what remained of the Crusader army attacked the Fatimid army outside Ascalon by surprise and completely routed it. With this decisive victory, the Crusade ended, Jerusalem now being out of danger for now. Yet another state had been established, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and Godfrey of Bouillon was elected its first king. A fourth crusader state, the county of Tripoli, was created two years later by Raymond of Toulouse in what corresponds to modern Lebanon just between the Principality of Antioch and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. In the following months, most of the surviving crusaders left the Holy Land, considering that their pilgrimage had been achieved, and hundreds of them returned to their region of origin, leaving only a handful to defend the new Latin states in the Middle East including the new kingdom of Jerusalem. Was it over? Far from that. The first crusade was over, but our story is just beginning. And in the second part, we will relieve how things unfolded, crossing paths with major historical figures like Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire, Richard Lionheart of England, Philip August of France, or Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt and Syria. This second part will be available soon. But for now, we are at the end of tonight's story. So you can now let go and fall asleep, or pick another story from my library if you want. Sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.